Okay, let's slowly get started. If you're ready. Good morning. Uh, my name is Robin Celicates, and I'm uh, really very delighted to be able to welcome you to this uh, final day of the conference and to the first plenary uh, talk of today. After dissecting, globalizing, and materializing critical theory, we have now arrived at the stage of recomposing critical theory. Uh, I must say that you already look relatively composed, given that we had such an intense um, day yesterday and uh, such um, long discussions, long into the evening. Uh, but it's really great to see so many of you here this morning for our uh, discussion um, of uh, Veronika Gago's uh, work. And um, the question that is guiding us is how do we have to recompose, how do we have to reconfigure the questions we ask in critical theory given uh, the multiple crises that we are facing and also how do we have to reconfigure the kinds of answers uh, that the, we are looking for but also the way in which we ask those questions. And I think it's obvious that um, Veronika Gago's work is an e extremely important reference point for precisely this kind of question, not just because of the substantial analyses that she provides but also the kind of um, theorizing, the kind of knowledge production that her work uh, exemplifies. So Veronica is, of course, a leading feminist activist and theorist uh, from Argentina. She's professor at the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Buenos Aires, uh, as well as at the Institute um, of Advanced Studies at the National University of San Martin. Um, she also held uh, many, many visiting professorships um, in different countries, most recently the Andres Bello Chair in Latin American Cultures and Civilizations at NYU. Um, based in her uh, political activism and practice and the kind of collective knowledge production that is happening in the um, collectives and movements that she's engaged in. Um, her work uh, has been inspiring in many, many different areas, uh, especially on feminism, neoliberalism, uh, the destructive effects of debt, and other questions. She's a member of uh, the um, leading, important, inspiring feminist movement Ni Una Menos, um, and was also part of the uh, early research and political collective Situaciones that has uh, investigated the first, not the first, but the um, more recent debt crisis in the early 2000s in, in, in Argentina in very important ways. Her publications include Neoliberalism from Below, Popular Pragmatics and Baroque Economies. Um, the book uh, appeared with Duke University Press in 2000. 17, most of you have read the widely discussed Feminist International, How to Change Everything, uh, a book that came out of Verso in 2020, is also available in German, and most recently, together with Lucy Caballero, um, A Feminist Reading of Debt, uh, came out of Pluto Press 2021. We are very grateful that you uh, came this long way. Uh, well, this time it was only from Paris, but in general, this long way from Argentina. Um, and we're very much looking forward to your talk. Um, after the talk, um, there will be a comment by Sarah Speck, um, uh, whom I'm also very happy to introduce. And, well, I cannot say welcome because we are the guests of um, the Institute that, that Sarah is uh, co-directing together with uh, Stefan. So we, we are all very grateful for the invitation and the hospitality. Sarah is a professor of sociology with a focus on women's and gender studies here at the Goethe University. She's a vice director of the Cornelia Goethe Center here in Frankfurt and both a member of the Research Council of um, the Institute for Social Research and the vice director of this institute. Uh, she's also a member of um, the really amazing editorial collective Kitchen Politics that is publishing uh, a series of queer feminist uh, interventions. And she has published widely uh, both academically and for the broader public on questions of gender um, inequality, uh, changing work relations, and many other topics that are at the heart of the um, theme we're discussing today. Thanks so much for both of you, uh, to both of you for being here, and the floor is yours, Vero. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, allow me to start by warmly 
thanking the organizers of the event for inviting me. I want to personally thank Stefan Lesenich, who first reached out to me, Robin Selitakis, our chair and friend, and especially to Sarah Speck, uh, who will be my commentator and who is also an interlocutor. Uh, Futuring critical theory is the catchphrase that bring us together here to celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the beginning of this intellectual adventure initially based in Frankfurt. As we know, Argentina, where I'm coming from, is not far removed from the materiality of that beginning. With the verb futurize, they invite us to wager on the possibilities of critique in a moment that seems to have certain elements in common with the scenario that motivated critical theory. The emergence of fascism and the question about how they manage to obtain support, collective support. For me, futurizing is a verb that can be conjugated from the events of the present. In opposition to the idea that there is no future, we can instead say that it's a matter of disputing the meaning of a verb that is very common and near to us. I am referring to the verb to speculate. Speculation is a way of managing the time to come, of fabulating its possibilities, of opening it up to the event. It is the same knowledge about the future that finance seeks to appropriate, effectively speaking of the future. This is one point that I think is key and that I will try to develop here, the containment of collective ways of speculating, or in other words, of imagining futures, and their capture by financial apparatuses. This occurs in direct competition with other ways of making future, produced in the here and now by recognizing concrete forms of interdependence in the crisis. I will tackle this question from a specific point of view. I will attempt to think from within the recent cycle of feminist movement in Argentina, and in particular, the practice of the feminist strike. When I say that it's from within, it is because I have placed myself within their organizational dynamics. We know this is a key point for critical theory. What is the relationship between theory and practice? What type of theory are we talking about? Where do we situate ourselves in order to critique? The feminist strike will serve as my entry point into a process that is simultaneously political, subjective, economic, cultural, artistic, libidinal, and epistemological. By process, I am not referring to a descriptive neutrality that substantiates the strike, but rather the strike itself as a process of invention, rupture, and at the same time of the accumulation of forces. The feminist strike produced a historic political innovation it took a tool from the labor movement and used it to protest against sexist violence. With that move, it demonstrated the systemic connection between economic, colonial, and gender violence against certain bodies. It explained through an act of rebellion why you could strike against femicides and at the same time against the looting of land and resources from territories against heterosis patriarchal mandates, and against precarious work, thus challenging neoliberalism in the household and on the streets. The strike as an undulating process draws a map of conflict that dilute the rigid borders between life and work, body and territory. The strike becomes a practical tool of political investigation and a process capable of constructing transversality between radically different bodies, conflicts, and territories. March 8 was re-established as a global date of demonstrations, recovering memories and genealogies, but above all, opening a common plane, a collective perception of a political movement. It launched a political process that is transnational and that put the issue of violence and reproductive labor in the center of the movement. Since then, 
from different geographies, we have been nourishing a process that has become increasingly complex over time, a process that requires sustaining transversal coordination each time. I think the conditions of the reproduction of the struggles is a very important point that we have also to, to discuss. The theory of social reproduction applied to the idea of the reproduction of the struggles. I have long been interested in a form of analysis that is situated in a sequence of struggles. That means developing an analysis as part of the struggle in which we are involved. The history of different struggles has taught that the potencia, the power of thought always has a body and a territory. That body is an ongoing and collective, even when individual, composition. One that assembles experiences, expectations, resources, trajectories, and memories. Maybe it's worth clarifying a distinction about the word situated, very well known nowadays, with at least two different meanings. One is situated as contextualized, and the other is situated, properly speaking, that we learn from feminist epistemologies. The difference is that contextualized does take into account the here and now, but does not necessarily imply being involved and active. We know that all thinking is partial, but situated thinking acknowledges this fact instead of being blind to it or denied it. Partial does not mean a small part, a fragment, or a splinter. Rather, it describes a piece in the art of bricolage, a specific assemblage or constellation as we learn from Benjamin. As well as we can relearn today, for example, from a Bolivian sociologist called Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui. As such, it functions as an entry point, a perspective that shows the singularity of an experience. This analysis is also partial in another sense by having a desire for intervention. It takes into account the strategic conditions that make it possible. It implies analysis from the point of view of something that is still going on, ongoing. Learning from Marx, we could say that is about always opening an analysis of specific conjunctures in relation to their structural conditions. But situated thinking is also a process. In this case, I want to draw a connection with the feminist cycle that we could call a commotion, a revolt, a revolution, which is even suffering from a ferocious counter-offensive that already constitutes this revolution, this uh, commotion, this revolt, a new starting point for thought committed to the construction of the common. From this cycle, which I, I insist is still open, we must be able to read important keys of the forms taken by their reaction of response to the opening of a new sensibility to evoke Marcuse that has been deployed. The cycle of feminist mobilizations and organizations that begin at the international level in 2015 and 2016 consolidates its growth between 2017 and 2019. Thus, it, in that three-year period, uh, running between 2017 and 2019, a movement scales up. I think because first, it produces the feminist strike as a tool for both practically and analytically politicizing violence. Second, the movement's transnational character expands, clearly push from the South. Third, it is tied together with campaigns which are also transnational for the right to abortion. And four, the feminist movement converges with grassroots revolts and indigenous protest dynamics in several Latin American countries against austerity, for example, in Chile, Colombia, and Ecuador. In this period, we can locate what I have been analyzing as an unprecedented combination for the feminist movement, the combination of massiveness and radicality. That is the unique feature of what can be characterized as a cycle. I understand the temporality of this cycle as an opening of a moment of generalized uprising. 
it expresses a particular experience of accumulation and production of subjectivity in its personal and collective dimension. I also want to emphasize the transnational dimension of this cycle that allows us to link experiences in different places pushed by the struggles from the south of the planet. The pandemic that began in 2020 comes to break this cycle of increasing feminist struggles and mobilizations. I want to say that the frame of understanding for this exceptional event, the pandemic, would not have been the same without the precedence of the struggles that I referred to at the beginning. Particularly, the problematization of the concrete territory of the exploitation of, of paid and unpaid work, what we have been discussing as essential uh, work, and contemporary forms of the privatization of social reproduction. Both issues have acquired an unprecedented significance as part of mobilizations and feminist struggles. The way out of the pandemic, in fact, takes place in a new scenario of impoverishment, of which Latin America holds the record. Simultaneously, the acceleration of the destructive dynamic in these two years of the pandemic has led to increased monopolistic concentration and brutality, continued by war, by the war and its geopolitical agenda. In our region, the extractivist advance reorganizes the territory to the point of fragmenting it into militarized zones distributed among corporations, the so-called lithium triangle between Argentina, Chile, and Bolivia. Even so, the feminist movement in Argentina during the pandemic managed to organize concrete dynamics of social reproduction from below, win the legalization of abortion, and sustain a significant organizational capacity. Also, it is important to think about this cycle transnationally, not something that is behind. Tomorrow, for example, is the first anniversary of the women's uprising in Iran. I want to point to a set of dynamics that explain the singularity of that cycle, of this cycle, that make it intelligible without casting them as simple causes. I would like to make three points. The first one, the movement of feminist uprisings has made single out and circulated a diagnostic of contemporary capitalist forms of violence with an accessible language. And at the same time, and this at the same time is very important, it has generated a desire for struggle. That combination is what has provoked a fierce reaction to the point of fueling part of the ultra-right and even fascist phenomena that we have seen recently. The feminist movement has brought us back to the issue of violence when it seemed that the neoliberal narrative, even critical approaches, focus on analyzing successful forms of pacification. The movement has been able to construct an analysis of different forms of violence that, starting from one, uh, one uh, own body and the territories they inhabit, expand their connection in order to make institutional, economic, racist and sexist violences intelligible. Thus, it manages to create a systemic reading of violences that shifts the focus away from interpersonal violence and relocates it in a structural register that, nonetheless, does not seem to be situated. For that very reason, since it's start from experience but is not limited to individual issues, it is able to create a practical understanding of the violence of capital in its neoliberal phrase, phase. The everyday is not synonymous with the small, but rather relaunches a critique that deepens our understanding of the current moment of capitalist depredation. The embodied and territorial dimension from which it approaches violence is key. This enables several things. On one hand, it allows for making a concrete analysis of the ways in which violence is expressed, articulated, and given meaning at the level of everyday experience. This work of weaving and the feminist strike was a fundamental tool for its deployment, functions precisely like a spider web 
only by producing a political cartography, connecting the threats that make different forms of violence function as interrelated dynamics, can we denounce the ways their segmentation seeks to enclose us and in, sorry, isolated cells? Such a cartography implies overflowing the confines of gender-based violence to link it with the multiple forms of violence that make it possible. In this way, we escape the corset of fewer victims to inaugurate a new political language that not only denounce violence against women, lesbian, trans, uh, non-binary, migrant, and indigenous bodies, moreover, moves from a single definition of violence as domestic or intimate and therefore excluded, to understand it in relation to a web of economic, financial, institutional, institutional labor, colonial, and other kinds of violence. I am interested in thinking about feminism, not just adding different perspectives, rather about ways of using feminist tools that actually make connections between different dimensions and different problematizations. In the case of Argentina, I refer to alliances between feminists in unions, in slums, in universities and schools, and with the workers of the popular economy, or the more well-known informal economy which also includes workers of small agricultural sectors, for example. It is a political composition that is new in its transversality. This capacity for alliances implied having the skill to include conflicts that, until recently, were not considered part of feminism concerns. Reinventing feminism itself, but above all, transversalizing a mode of action and feminist problematization in a political in, polit in political spaces. Understood in this way, violence is not an enormous capital letter word producing that other equally enormous, equally abstract capital letter word, victim. This is the second new element of the reconceptualization of violence. It is from that there that the comprehension of violence as a complete phenomenon is produced. Each person's body as a trajectory and experience thus become the entry point, a concrete mode of localization from which a specific point of view is produced. How is violence expressed? How does it take a particular form in each body and territory? How do we recognize this? How do we fight it? This embedded understanding of violence enables a questioning that runs transversally across each space, from the family to the union, from the school to the community center, from the border to the plaza. But it does so by giving this questioning a material, familiar, corporeal anchor. However, an important clarification is needed. The common element is not violent, violence. Rather, the common is produced by the situated and transversal questioning of violence. Drawing connections between forms of violence gives us a shared perspective that is both specific and expansive, critical but not paralyzing that links different experiences. Mapping forms of violence based on their organic connection without losing sight of the singularity of the production of the nexus between them and without being demobilizing is a central challenge. I will come back of this double idea of uh, against victimism and against paralyzing uh, approach. The feminist strike also reveals that today class and race are experienced very concretely through sexist violence because those forms of patriarchal power are related to and directly articulated with types of work and remuneration, access to justice, housing, and forms of criminalization, especially in the most precarious economies. From the feminist struggles, we can build a cartography, I insist, that is transnational and connects with the historical debates about the popular and the subaltern, about class, race, and gender in not only the name Latin America, but also Abi Ayala, that is an indigenous name, and also Amefrica Ladina, as the black feminist uh, Leila Gonzalez named this geography. It is this practical diagnosis that makes a movement, mapping the connections between different forms of violence without being solely an analytical discourse. 
it is that practical diagnosis in the streets that produces a strategic displacement, an escape from the figure of the victim and the construction of an embodied sense of freedom in being together. The strike sets the political scene for these connections, but these connections are not limited to the moment of the strike. As I will argue later, they have been essential for traversing the period of the pandemic. It is also essential to understand today how they are prolonged in feminist struggles that politicize social reproduction. The dispute over the diagnosis of violence is at the same time the dispute over their mobilization in support of the militarization of social conflict by state and parastate forms and the reactionary subjectivation that the right is taking advantage today. So my second point, and this brings me to my second point, the feminist struggles dispute at the level of sensibility and the construction of infrastructure of social reproduction, a different political elaboration of the crisis. They do not evade the issue of violence nor the fears that emerge today in the face of, of insecurities over the reproduction of everyday life. Therefore, they are contested and become a target both for religious fundamentalism and right wings. Over the past decade, unprecedented forms of violence reorganize social conflict, driven by new forms of territorial authority linked to illegal economies in collusion with police, political and judicial structures. These new forms of territorial authority confronted the popular, highly feminized economies which were structured on the basis of social movements, especially in Argentina after the 2001 crisis. It was finance with its high level of abstraction that took charge of this articulation from below and from above of subjectivities that had to procure prosperity without taking for granted the privilege of, a word, of the wage as their main income. In Latin America, this was produced in connection with a neo-extractivist type of insertion in the global market of our countries. The new forms of violence are translated into an intense segmentation of hierarchies, space based on differential access to security, with, which promotes a sort of civil war over the defense of property between periphery, perif peripheral neighborhoods and wealthy areas, but also within the more popular zones themselves. Today, illegal economies organize the vacuum left in many spaces by the retreat of wage labor and the uh, privatization of uh, public infrastructure. They provide employment, resources, and belonging, as well as a mode of affirmation of male authority. Uh, all of which are confirmed through territorial control on a daily basis. This supposes an accelerated passage on the, of the thresholds of violence that is structured the everyday. It is not a coincidence that the other path of recomposition of that male authority is through recruitment in state security forces and parastate networks. In this way, legal and illegal forces of confrontation substitute for the majoritarian model of waged authority, decisively contributing to the increase in violence and the implosion of homes as the violence of those security forces spills over into the home. There is one more economy that must be accounted for, one that is booming and growing, the churches that offer access to employment and promises of prosperity as they manage to weave together a network of resources in increasingly critical everyday situations. Illegal economies on one hand and the theology of prosperity of or charity on the other forge different modalities of an economy of obedience in a context of everyday impoverishment. Here, the role of finance through the apparatus of debt, the household debt has been fundamental as we have been researching in recent years, 
the record external debt, along with the inflation and consequent loss of purchase, purchasing power of state benefits, pensions, and wages, has forced people to take out debt to access basic goods like food and medicine. This situation especially affected women, lesbian, and trans from the popular sectors. One clear example of this phenomena also is seen in the appearance of mass indebtedness through the child allowance, mainly distributed to women, which primarily serves as a guarantee for different types of credit. Debt as a financial technology was directly capillarized as protection against precarization. This is a, a sort of paradox. What is different about this phenomenon is that going into debt is not longer associated with a specific purchase of a good or a service, but rather become a permanent and mandatory way of making up free falling incomes. A whole new equation is produced between incomes and debt, when those incomes, whether or not waged, no longer guarantee reproduction. Debt in the home, when it is structured as an everyday mandate, is organized under the formula of going into debt in order to live. Often this is not mediated by the wage, but rather by state benefits. Debt, in turn, is multiplied in credit offers that assemble different degrees of violence when their compliance is requested. In 2017, the Nuna Menos Collective launched the slogan, we want to live debt free, a few months after the, the first international feminist strike. Since then, this way of intersecting the issue of sexist violences and economic violences became a powerful interpretative key for social movement. The slogan, the debt is owed to us, was starting on March 8, 2020, take, taken up by unions, universities, migrant collectives, grassroots organizations, the Pride March. This slogan proliferated because it was intelligible in terms of general comprehension. By this, I want to say that the feminist movement also draws attention to an analysis, one of the most abstract forms of violence, financial violence. By using a feminist pedagogy, it grounds it as a concrete apparatus of exploitation and violence in bodies and territories. How is this pedagogy about debt possible at a mass scale in a way that makes the home the starting point and not the traditional, we don't owe the IMF, that is also a problem in Argentina. I think this is because the feminist movement expanded the way of understanding what is understood by unpaid work. Because precarity is based on differential forms of exploitation and finally, because social reproduction is in the center of a social understanding from below, from the sub oils of production, that however already functions out in the open and at a scale that goes beyond the notion of domestic confinement. Furthermore, this was possible because a specific point of view was put in play, discussing finance in terms of everyday conflictivity, with concrete embodied situated narratives, and therefore a conflictivity that could be understood as self-defense of autonomy against financial violence. It has been useful to point out that predatory link with social reproduction in a moment of austerity policies and to denounce its articulation with gender mandates associated with individual and family responsabilization. Making these issues a key piece of political work and mobilization, and not only an analytical perspective, allow for relaunching the issue of the external debt in public debate in other terms, with another political grammar. This implies disputing the meaning of speculation. Aris Comporosos proposes thinking about the proliferation of speculation in terms of a shift from homo economicus to homo speculans, to account for a collective condition for dealing with the uncertainty and opacity of everyday life. It is was also Paolo Birno in other times referred to uh, as uh, mass opportunism, that is the ability to identify opportunities 
in situations of instability that is expressed as a political subjectivity. But what the Greek author highlights, and I like very much, is the acceleration of the condition of speculation through digital technologies that commodify, as they are proposed as digital infrastructure, that propensity from below to collectively speculate, that is, imagine what will come. As a counterpart, as a counterpart I want to think about how, by denouncing debt, by denouncing indebtedness, the feminist praxis has been able to vindicate another type of speculative community. I think this is inseparable from the ways in which networks of feminist organizations have led the dispute over the social revalorization of reproductive tasks in a context in which their political function has become a new source of dignity and prestige in neighborhoods as their protagonists are socially and politically recognized thanks to the feminist politicization. This situation opens up, opens up challenges to authority in the face of new threshold of cruelty in the webs of violence, whose favored target is uh, women, lesbian, travestis, and trans people. The feminist contestation of possessive individualism as a way of understanding the world had an enormous force in experiences of organization, mobilization, and the subversion of every day. It was important for rethinking care, for example, by saying, the police don't take care of me, my friends take care of me. For understanding also the expansion of the sensibility of the body by declaring, if they touch one of us, we all respond. On making it clear that we are not going to pay for the crisis with our bodies and our territories. These are all examples in which, in a simple and powerful way, that collective experience becomes knowledge, political knowledge. In the pandemic, that framework was sustained as a way of making, um, uh, making what was happening intelligible. That is what made it possible to denounce domestic violence in condition of force enclosure, uh, as well as the violence of eviction, placing homes in the center of the conflict. The New Namenos Collective, in collaboration with the Tenants Union, launched, uh, we launched a campaign, home, that it, it was called, Home Should Not Be a Site of Sexist Violence or Real Estate Speculation. Thus, we play a role in rendering visible the increasing number of denunciations of violence in the moment of stay at home, as well as how people have to coexist with the threat of eviction. This counter methodology against what we call property violence was sustained by transfeminist networks during the pandemic, which were capable of making a collective body when everything became an invective of isolation as a paradigm of security. So my third point, since the beginning of the cycle of the struggles that I am discussing, there is another important feature of the feminist movement that is worth highlighting. I think that the feminist movement it is um, inhabited by a desire for theory. This means a vital organic need to produce concepts, to find words, to try out ways of narrating what is happening. Feminism proposes a struggle at the level of knowledges, pedagogies, and sensibilities that the right has de denominated gender ideology. With this point, I also want to think about the role of theory for the recent feminist movement in particular and for the emancipatory social movements of our times in more general terms. We can confirm a proliferation of slogans, songs, fanzines, reading groups, books, newspapers. There is enormous quantity of debates, encounters, seminars, self-education spaces, changes to university curricula, etc. All of this is part of a theoretical, political proliferation that makes a specific dispute, making it uh, so that the cry and the concept are not completely separate elements. That the, the cry that is enough, stop killing us, that is also always referred as the first moment of the 
feminist mobilization at the beginning of movements such as Nuna Menos, but others uh, too, does not remain stuck in the crying of pain, but rather unfolds in terms of a struggle, including both conceptual and programmatic terms. It is not a matter of an opposition between a cry that would be non-conceptual and elaborated theory, but rather another displacement. That that's enough, that rejection opens up a field of theoretical, narrative, and argumentative dispute that is crucial. Later, that desire for theory has to do with the same dynamic of inventing names and narratives for what must be said differently. This versatility with conceptual language expresses it, a capacity to make practice an interrogative form with comings and goings, trial and errors, wagers. It is not coincidence, as Bell Hook uh, said, that the feminist willingness to change direction when necessary has been one of the feminist movement's largest sources of strength and vitality. As in other historical moments as well, intimacy with the ability to start speaking a new language, to criticize oneself, to reopen past debates, has to do with the vitality of a movement that thinks as it moves. Thinking is thus one of the movement's attributes. But furthermore, I want to add that in this cycle that I am speaking about, that conceptualization is strongly pushed from the South. The feminist movement has taken up that decolonizing dimension of theoretical practice that makes a theory from the struggle, that does not delink mobilization from concepts, and that appropriates from text and invents terms for making them converse with the situations and conjunctures that we are going through. This means a vital, I, I insist, organic need to produce concept and to try out ways of narrating. This differentiates the feminist movement from other social movements, which often repeat the anti-intellectual gesture as a guarantee of authenticity of experience. This is expressed in the need to reopen the collective debate about violence, about its forms, which means both rejecting the language of a crime of passion, for example, and of interpersonal violence, to establish an understanding of femicide, travesticide, as a political act. It also means declustering domestic violence from the private sphere. But going further, I would like to argue that the theory of violence is being systematized here in which concepts take power in the streets. I am particularly interested in how the feminist perspective has recentered an analysis of war in its uh, yes, perspective, enable a systemic characterization of contemporary violence. That analysis, particularly in regard to femicidal violence as an individualization of war, has two fundamental characteristics. One, it shifts shift from the notion of war to another grammar of, confl of conflictivity. It shifts the notion of war to another grammar of conflictivity. And two, it renews the need for a theory of violence without being demobilizing and victimizing. By this, I am referring to how recent feminist struggles have produced a place from which to simultaneously characterize contemporary neoliberal violence without losing the capacity for political action. This way of weaving together a conceptualization of violence with forms of actions in the street, in neighborhoods, and in social organizations expresses the importance of the theoretical territory. I think that several feminist formulations um, that are thinking, uh, for example, in the conceptualization of war against women and again, again uh, disobedient uh, bodies provide a framework for understanding the new types of wars and also allow for reading other wars. Redeploying the term war to speak for a permanent state of war against certain bodies and certain territories has popularized Silvia Federici's thesis of the extent to which the devaluation of life and reproductive migrant and peace and labor driven by contemporary globalization shapes a neoliberal violence that has not been subsumed 
in the vice of subjective pacification and cannot be understood in terms of societies of control. The concept of new forms of war capable of analyzing violence against the body of women and dissident bodies in relation to the illegal economies, as Rita Segato proposes, for example, also renews the lexicon as well as strategic thought about a war that is no longer returned to clearly identify, um, identify uh, groups in a single stage of contention. Also from Mexico, Raquel Gutierrez Aguilar has characterized uh, the war in relation to the systematic aggression against the fabrics of community and communal reproduction and in analogy with cruelty toward women and nature. In this sense, the ways in which anti-extractivist struggles understand extractivism as a war to conquer territories, the displacement of populations, assassination of leaders of conflicts, is a way of accumulating this narrative that places the perspective of war in filigree. With this, I want to emphasize that neoliberal violence as a part of war, of thinking about war, has been put on the table by a set of feminist debates that are hosted and scaled up in the mass mobilizations. That mobilization is what uh, was able to establish that uh, gender-based violence is a key structural element of the ongoing war, updating variations in the very dynamic of what we understand by war. Where the experience of searching for our own narrative liberates the potential, the capacity to act, we see the desire for theory materialized as praxis. I would like to, to dwell also as a final point to the idea of slogans that make a movement to recreate the formulation by the Chilean feminist Julieta Kirkwood, who made feminist theory thinking about a movement that is made up of questions. Thinking about questions that make a movement shows an analytical procedure that positions the critical and interrogative dimension as a strength. There is a strategic formulation in going from questions to slogans. This is not to say that questions do not have a strategic element, quite the opposite. The interrogative forms is strategic because it's open up a horizon. The slogans strength comes from connecting bodies and statements that express a conjuncture. When we read slogans that make sense beyond borders, they indicate dates in which those words express a moment and theses that organize a ways of understanding and even orienting what is happening. Luxembourg, Rosa Luxembourg, was very optimistic in this regard. Um, in more or less words, she argued that whoever decides the slogan organizes the struggle. Slogan express both corporeal and atmospheric transformation, which are translated into ways of experiences, experiencing violence, self-defense, insecurity, collective strength, the dispute over everything that constitutes the perseverance of living in increasingly difficult contexts. These slogans imply transformations in body they materialize thresholds in relationship, establish a collective horizon, and articulate a language. In short, they synth synthesize a moment. We can identify the construction of a common text program in the proliferation of recent feminist slogan in the movement ability to translate them, move them geographically, and at the same time vindicate uh, them as their own. The slogans develop the questions of how to build a political language capable of addressing heterogeneous conditions of domination and exploitation in different parts of the world while articulating a common desire for liberation. At the same time, slogans demonstrate a certain experience of untranslat... Uh, this is a very difficult word... untranslatability. A slogan is strongly tied to the explosion of its sound, its rhythm, and often to a poetical or historical meanings that cannot be easily preserved in another language. Even so, they also increasingly make up part of a common language, even for exorcising their differences, for making ruptures. 
What is the dissonance between Nuna Menos and Me Too, for example? Is the chant about popular power that we made in Latin America understood as a feminist demand everywhere? How has the slogan, it is not love, it's unpaid labor, which jumped from a text by Silvia Federici onto the street, proliferated? This process of migration is historical. The slogan, vivas nos queremos, uh, we want ourselves alive, propelled from Mexico, resonates with the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, Mothers of Plaza de Mayo, when they said at the height of the dictatorship in Argentina, they took them alive, we want them alive. Vivos se los llevaron, vivos los queremos. To demand the appearance of their children who had been disappeared. It is similar to how the phrase ni una menos is taken from the Mexican poet Susana Chavez to become a transborder movement and relocate Ciudad Juarez, creating new political proximities. We could trace a whole cartography of the re-emergencies, re-interpretations, appearances, and translations as wagers on meaning. It is not coincidence that in, his historical, in this historical cycle of feminist mobilization, a phenomenon such as the Chilean collective Las Tesis occurs. The very name refers to a vindication of theoretical thesis, taken to the street through a text and performance, The Rapist is You, become an international song because it was able to eloquently synthesize the movement's state of the debate, the theoretical formulas that are part of the collective understanding because they are part of protest on the street and all a, a sort of language of choreography. Uh, that also translate, uh, transcends translation, so to speak. It is almost like a reworking of that concern that Eleanor Marx, a militant translator, had as she imagined international languages as a set of codes and gestures capable of rendering political styles, uses, and words comprehensible. Without doubt, the desire for theory includes a strategy and a form of a transnational existence that makes mass pedagogy one of its prim primary concerns. On this terrain, we can also recognize a reactionary alarm which takes language, educational forms, and content as a favor is paid for its attack and counter offensive. One of the reactions' central point is combating gender ideology. As the Brazilian thinker Sonia Correa argues, gender ideology is a multi-headed idra, which encompasses gender language, school and university curricula, media content, laws for the right to abortion and sexual and reproductive rights in a broad sense, as well as the attack of transfeminist intellectual leaders and theological debates with ideology as the common axis of this series of political questions being confronted, in other words, on being the, as she said, the structuring term of a conservative political economy, we can read against the grain of this reaction in order to recognize the formative, intellectual, and pedagogical importance of transfeminist movement. Just a final comment. In their counteroffensive, I think the rights speak out of three terms that historically have belonged to emancipatory projects. They speak of violence under the name of insecurity. They speak of ideology under the notion of gender ideology. And they speak of structural reforms through the notion of structural adjustment. Violence, ideology, and structure represent three key terms that signal the importance of the narrative and conceptualization at work. The perspective of social reproduction has been generalized in recent years thanks to a political comprehension of its centrality, similar to what happened in the 70s. The pandemic was in turn the confirmation of an attempt to deny that centrality. Capital has used the global pandemic to reconfigure forms of labor, modes of consumption, the parameters of income, uh, sex-gender relations, and new forms of extraction. With this text, I wanted to bring together some 
different elements for an hypothesis that we have been developing collectively, that we are facing a restructuring of class relations which takes this fear of social reproduction as its main stage. This includes household, but also reproductive work that is carried out beyond the walls of the home in impoverished and financialized territories, self-managed economies that at the same time demand public resources and seek to sustain infrastructure of care and support against precarity. The political centrality that social reproduction has achieved, the reemergence of this idea force, is not only an academic debate, and even less a technical one. It refers to characteristics that contemporary feminist struggles have addressed and confronted with the capacity to make the most accurate diagnosis of forms of exploitation, domination, and violence of contemporary capitalism. I think it is essential to deepen this debate to understand the conservative reaction a politics that claims to be rebellious, that is, uh, in its reaction, seem to make a realistic evaluation of how democratic dynamics are increasingly deficient in terms of their ability to, produ to provide a dignified life. From there, the rights mobilize anti-elitist feelings and meanings from which they seek to assemble new interpolations, especially among those who have experienced that everyday war and those who have been dispossessed from their role as provided and carrier of hierarchies guaranteed by the patriarchal type of order. The expansion of debt, especially as household debt, but in connection with public debt, functions as a dynamic of containment that organizes a certain experience of the current crisis while becoming a sort of continuum and skillfully managing the emergency. The sphere of reproduction is not safe from violence. It's not a romantic idea of the sphere of reproduction, nor, it, um, nor it is a source of common as an uncontaminated space, but rather almost the opposite. It is there where today predatory and extractive machines swarm that test out virulent extractive operations of capitals because that is also where concrete politics of confrontation of the demarcation of limits and frontiers and feminist pop and where feminist popular and communitarian organization are capable of develop counter methodologies those counter methodologies are not one directional and they deal with the com against the versatility of translation provided by finance. It is also where the most precarious forms of the proprietary affirmation displays scenes of violence, of true civil wars in silence, confirming that violence is a privileged and irreplaceable productive force for capital, as Marx and those who continue his critical threat reiterate. In opposition to the ways in which finance, and what I call financial extractivism seeks to foster guilt and individualized responsibility for containing radical dispossession within a property-based regime, perspective of interdependence, and I am quoting here Judith Butler, enable an action of um, and a program against extractivism, dispossession, and the forms of global accumulation that affect certain bodies and territories in a differential way. It allows for understanding new forms of financial colonization that are articulated with dynamics of intensive extraction. Therefore, struggles against extractivism become anti-systemic struggles. In a similar way, struggles to guarantee social reproduction become anti-systemic when they question everything from real estate rent to regressive tax structures concentrated land ownership and inflation of food prices. The praxis of popular anti-racist migrant mass feminism has produced a concrete language of the situation. It sustains material places for elaborating the crisis and is presented as a territory of new connections for affects and their capacity for other speculations. In that sense, the feminist movement or the feminist in a very 
pluralistic uh, sense that emerged in the last cycle that is very important in the South has taken, one, um, has taken on some of the most fundamental issues against capitalist, capitalist enclosures of life in new forms of financial exploitation and extractivism. Political organizational work is not separated from a dispute over languages and conceptual contents. At the stake there is the possibility of connecting different struggles as a concrete form of political transversality for the articulation of a common desire of liberation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Veronica. Does that work? Can every, everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Veronica. It is um, really, thank you for your um, lecture, inspiring lecture. It's really an honor to, um, to make this um, comment, to have the opportunity for this comment. And I want to very briefly start with the first three encounters I had with uh, Veronica. The first one was in I think in, when in my feminist collective in Berlin, we discussed about the possibility of mobilizing to a strike in, in Berlin. And um, a friend, comrade, asked me to translate one of your texts uh, from Spanish to, to German, and I had never heard of your name. And it was like, well, that is a really brilliant analysis. I'm delighted to translate it. A, a year after, in 2018, we met in an activist meeting with around 50 pe 15 people and. Berlin Kreuzberg and discussed again the question of mobilization and no that was in 2019 and then in 2020 I saw that her book was been has been translated into English and there was a huge book presentation book launch with Judith, Judith Butler, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, somebody else I do not remember uh, a day after the victory of the of passing the bill to the right of abortion and um, I wanted to attend this, um, this book presentation, which was in the pandemic online. Has anybody, anybody of you been there? So I entered the room, and then it was bing, 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 bing. And there were 20,000 people attending this book launch uh, worldwide. And it was, hi from Moscow, hi from everywhere. <laughs> and it, says it was really a brilliant um, um, experience, especially in the pandemic. So I have the honor to make this comment today. And it also gives me the chance to, chance to express how much I'm inspired by your approach and how important I find the inspiration you give to the feminist movement and, of course, also to critical theory. I will um, focus on some points I hope will be stimulating for the discussion that already has unfolded uh, in the course of the conference. And I am very much looking forward to pursue the, these and further questions uh, in the near future in Buenos Aires and in Frankfurt, because I'm happy that uh, Veronica is going to be in Frankfurt for you for a few weeks next year. I will divide my comment into three aspects. First, in her talk, Veronica presents very fascinating thoughts and considerations with, which correspond strikingly well with our discussion at the EFS and the Desideratum and the formulated desideratum of a theory of praxis, praxis theory of the possible. It is precisely this kind of thinking, starting from a political praxis, that provides answers to the questions of why the existing works. How is it possible was an initial question formulated by Stefan Lesnig in our discussions. In the EFS Perspectives paper, it is stated what material but also ideological interests are tied up with the maintenance of the status quo? Who can afford societal business as usual who has to pay for it? Who has to function but is exploited, excluded and rendered invisible thereby? Who is still adamant today about the necessity and possibility of radical social change?" Unquote. It is exactly these questions that you, Veronica, take up with your theoretical work. In doing so, you demonstrate that in the movements and the transversal feminist mobilizations in Argentina and beyond, from the South, as you say, as you say that is, in the very concrete political work 
an analytical view of interconnections is provided that helps us to answer the questions I have just men mentioned from the paper. These interconnections show in what ways and by means of what techniques of power and domination the existing social order functions and highlights the simultaneity of practices of dispossession, exploitation and submission in the current formation of the capitalist regime of global accum accumulation. These practices make the existing possible by means of an economy of obedience and apt formulation, I think, and at the same time are simultaneously invisibilized as techniques of power and domination. The thinking and practice of feminist movements in recent decades make it very clear who is paying the price here. And it is the practice and conceptual work itself, as you emphasize, that weaves and widens the nets of those who strive for radical change. So the theory of practice, the praxis theory of the possible that you outline captures both moments, the stability or better the continuation and stabilization of what exists, but also the potentia to change everything. And I think it is so important to emphasize again that also in this context that it has been feminist contexts that have unleashed such power for change and shifted the horizons of the thinkable in recent decades, precisely because they have such a broad understanding of social reproduction. My second point. Through the processes of weaving or mapping, also to terms of yours, in the context of conceptual work and political processes, it is thus also possible to address the differences or divisions produced by domination. This is very much in the spirit of Regina Becker-Schmidt, a German feminist and critical theorist, who, as a former student and research assistant of Adorno, advanced Adorno's thinking and, in some aspect, turned it against his own arguments, thinking with Adorno against Adorno, as she wrote. The critical theorist, or the dialectician, she argues, is able to highlight the differences and divisions, as well as the social mediations and the unifying elements that operate behind these divisions. However, in your reflection, the feminist movements are those dialecticians who, through the situated and transversal questioning of violence, address both the difference, differences and divisions produced by domination, as well as their interconnections, but from an interested, interest that is not primarily theoretical, but practical and political. And through this analytical work, so the clue or the punchline, so to say, of your argumentation, political power arises because it allows to overcome the position of the victim. In my view, this again raises the question of, to the, of the role of intellectuals and their relationship to social movements for critical and emancipatory theory building. And we have touched that question already yesterday evening. Your theory of praxis is rooted in post-operaist thinking, which was and is very much a strategic thinking that aimed more concretely at political practice than the critical theory of the Frankfurt School ever did. In Adorno, respectively, the classical theoretical, uh, critical theoretical understanding, the relation between theory and practice is thought dial dialectically, precisely because of the space that academia or theory have in bourgeois society, similar to art, a space for reflection and critique emer emerges there. The work of critically theorizing might indeed be inspired and fed by political emancipatory movements and is guided, of course, by the same interest in seeking to abolish suffering. However, theory is relieved in this thinking of the need of acting and for this very reason, offers the preconditions for critical thinking, provided, however, that it is critical reflect, reflexive with, with regard to precisely its very position and conditions. Now, in your approach, you, proceeding from, from the feminist struggles, assume the, the opposite. It is precisely the suffering, the striving for something radically different, and the em emancipatory desire that is in and through the attempt of political organizing in search for theory. And this theory is formulated in very different places and in different ways, in slogans, for example, often precisely not in the academy or in academia, but in a feminist epistemic community. 
but the priority is the political and the process of organization, not the knowledge and the sense of erkenntnis. So my underlying question is who weaves the web? And this is especially important when it, comes, when it becomes a pedagogy, as you say, as you name it, which always has a moment of power. So we can, of course, make it easy for ourselves and say, we together weave it, and this is, of course, somehow certainly true, but from my point of view, such an answer would somehow also obscure some problems behind or beneath. These include, for example, are the terms that have mobilizing power always the theoretical adequate ones to illum illuminate the constitution of society? Is the intellectual the mouthpiece of the movement who, who um, builds maybe also um, an academic career on collective theorizing? Is a dialectical relationship between theory pra and practice tenable if political mobilization is the primacy? My third point. Your conceptualization of violence from a, from a perspective within the movement is intriguing. And I do definitely agree for the debate and the updating for the critical theoretical program in the sense of a theory of crisis and of praxis, relations and experiences of violence are crucial. And I find the analysis of violence as a productive force in capitalism very well productive, especially for a feminist analysis. From my point of view, it is nevertheless important not to let violence and domination conceptually merge into one. As it is important to actually also take into account the specificity of different techniques of maintaining domination. And this also con concerns an analysis of different ways of body-related violence that produce difference. The conception of violence as you conceive it is again above all a political one, if I understand you correctly. The analysis of the interconnections between the various techniques of power and domination that can be drawn through this concept of violence allows for the emergence of a broad transversal movement. And thus, it operates, and you ha have highlighted that, quite differently than victimizing and disciplining concepts of violence, for example, in the context of state institutions or NGOs. But your conception also operates differently from the way I think violence is being understood in many political contexts in the last years. In many left-wing contexts, the concept of violation has taken hold that operates primarily morally and leads, for example, to the demand of safe spaces, spaces free from, from violence. And I have a profound skepticism about conceptualizations like these, and I believe that they, ha that they have the opposite effect of wh what you described and theorized as potentia. I would be interested to know what you think about this, and also with regard to the, spect uh, the aspect I've mentioned before, if you also th see maybe theoretical, not po political, but theoretical difficulties or limits in labeling very different experiences as me and mechanisms, all as modes of violence. To put it bluntly, it is not difficult to, ana uh, to analytically categorize land grabbing and expropriation, femicide and rape as forms of violence, of course. With regard to debt, I think the situation of a female peasant with a microcredit is different, of course, um, from an indebted middle class academic with a student loan in Germany who um, um, is confronted with a rent increase. Although in all of them, of course, power is undoubtedly expressed and capitalist domination is evident. So these are my three comments and I want just uh, very brief briefly to add one question and come back to our second encounter, which was the feminist activist um, meeting in Berlin-Kreuzberg. So after all these years that you have now been traveling discussing these ideas, what are you, your, or would you, what would you say about was, what was the difficult word translatability? Wasn't that? Um, of these experiences, um, are the experiences of weaving a web around the concept of violence, which are, as I understand it, deeply rooted also in the specific context and dis the context of discussions in Latin America, Abiyala, possible to translate to other contexts in what way can slogans, in what way can slogans really cross the borders and how can we build a political language transversal but also transnational. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you so much, uh, Vero, and thank you, Zara, for these very incisive comments and questions. Um, Vero, you will have the chance to give a maybe selective and brief response. Uh, we're running uh, quite late, and I want to have some space and time for questions. So yeah, why don't you uh, pick and choose some of the aspects of Sarah's comment, and then I'll collect some questions from the audience. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. And very um, briefly, uh, I, I was thinking in your uh, sentence, the premises, the political and the organization, and what about the epistemic? But I think, for example, um, that when there is no pre-existing what to do, you have to create something, and this is uh, an epistemic challenge, I think. Uh, and when I am talking about the, the feminist strike, I am also thinking in a political program and also in a political research program in terms that we have to invent what does mean strike in each situation. And this is the uh, inclusive character that I think is important in the feminist strike. Because at the same time, it's a sort of political tool that uh, could include very different realities of labor. Uh, and uh, I, I was thinking, for example, in these uh, connections, how does it mean strike if you are uh, against neo-structivism? What do, does it mean is if you are against, for example, um, precariousness, but you are um, unemployed? So what does it mean strike? So I think that this capacity of uh, invention involves an epistemic uh, community. Uh, and I, I, when you were uh, asking who whips the, the links, I think that the political activism and the assemblies are a sort of uh, epistemological community uh, where you discuss, you evaluate the situation, and uh, you can also uh, assemble the force to become operative what you are discussing. And I think this is uh, also very important as, as a sort of device of collective intelligence. No? That this is, for me, how we can build devices of collective intelligence with the capacity to become operative what we are discussing. And I like very much the, the uh, example uh, of the slogans, not as, as, a, as a sort of uh, image, uh, as a sort of political technology of the slogans. You were mentioning yesterday some slogans uh, too. I think that they condense a sort of um, political knowledge, but also they uh, produce a capacity to act um, and uh, they also have, um, have this problem of traducibilidad and intraducibilidad, the capacity to be translated or not. Uh, and I think that the, the translation is a political program. No, it's, also, it's a political problem and it's a political program because how we can translate, for example, the idea of feminist strike in very different context. I think this is the, the challenge, how we invent a content for the strike in very different situations and geographies and, um, well, yes, uh, also vital moments. Uh, and the other thing that is important is something that I insist that the strike is not only a date, it is a process. No, and also it's programmatic desire, for example, I like very much how the Chilean movement, they said, we are building a program against the precarization of life. Well, you have to do it concretely. After saying that, for example, one March 8, you have to produce concrete contents of this uh, programmatic desire. And I think that this is interesting how you can build it beyond March 8 or beyond the moment of demonstration. Um, I'm very interested in how to build massiveness uh, beyond the moment of visibility in the streets. Thank you so much. So we have time for some questions. Uh, Eve and let's see, we'll, we'll collect a few and then, yeah, you in the front. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if I could ask you to, um, uh, to respond to Sarah's uh, third question about, uh, about violence and the relationship to domination. Yeah. Yeah. And um, maybe one can also get to this at a, from a slightly different angle, namely from the, the history of feminist theory, because in um, second wave feminism, the topic of violence was obviously central, right? And so in the 1970s, um, both uh, domestic violence, uh, rape, but also pornography were all understood as, uh, as forms of violence. And um, various feminist authors tried to build um, social theories on the basis of, uh, of such violence. I'm thinking of Brown Miller, but also to some extent McKinnon, um, to some extent Andrew Dworkin. Um, and um, at the same time, you had people like um, Johann Galtung making arguments from the sort of like peace studies angle about structural violence and cultural violence and various ways to do something that seems somewhat similar to what, what, what you're doing, which is using violence as a sort of like a, a broad conceptual umbrella under which we can capture various forms of power and domination and so on. Now, I think these, uh, these approaches were largely um, unsuccessful um, in terms of both mobilization but also theoretically. And, um, uh, and so um, I'm just wondering to what extent you think that the current mobilization um, the current cycles of feminist mobilization is different in this regard, or why do you think that the category of violence now, in some sense, could be more productive than it was in um, earlier cycles of mobilizations a few decades ago? Thank you. Um, and then Mareike. Thank you, uh, Veronica, for this really inspiring presentation. And I can only like join into uh, Sarah Speck's um, tribute that your work was really inspiring to me and a lot of my colleagues and students. So thank you for that. I would be interested um, in the effective dimension of protest, but also of collective theorizing, um, because you talked about how the cry kind of kicks off a social movement, and that is often a cry that formulates a certain kind of no, like don't kill us. Um, and you talked about how this could relate to fear. So maybe you can say a little bit more about what you think about the effective dimension of both um, being a co like a praxis collective, but also theorizing collectively. Thank you. Okay, and then finally, a third question here in the front, Esteban. And then you'll have the chance to answer, and then we have to see whether we still have time for a second round. Veronica. Felicitaciones por la presentación. Me, me pareció excelente. Thank you very much, Veronica. I, I, I think that it was really brilliant, your presentation. You talk about cycles of feminism and, your, and cycles of struggle. And you also talk about current alliance uh, as form of expansion of the movement that is redefining it at this conjuncture. As we know, it is very possible that Javier Milei will win the next elections, the completely insane candidate of the extreme right, eh, which in an anti-feminist imprint, as you say. So how do you imagine the reworking of the field of alliance in the face of that great aggression that will most likely come? I know I'm asking a lot uh, of, because it's very uncertain, but we have to prepare for what's coming. I would like you to tell us your political ideas about that possible future, particularly in relation, as I said, to the dynamic of alliance in a very dangerous moment, which will not be one of 
expansion, but of greater resistance. And that will surely be part of your subsequent theorizing about the cycle of feminism. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for the, the questions. Uh, yes, I, I, I was not um, answering uh, Sarah's, uh, I forgot about uh, violence and domination and Latif's uh, put it again. I, I think that, of course, it's not a new issue or theme or, or um, question, but I think that it's interesting to think uh, against the idea of violence as a general umbrella. I think that the, quite the opposite, that the violence is a very concrete uh, experience and as a concrete experience could be articulated with other forms of violence and to go beyond the idea of domestic violence. Um, so I think that was the uh, political exercise of the feminist movement to think about uh, violence that is, a, as you said, a traditional issue and problem, uh, problem of the, the, the feminist approaches and the feminist movement, but how uh, in a neoliberal context that domestic violence or interpersonal violence uh, connects directly with a sense of dispossession, of exploitation and extraction, and how you do that with a political uh, work, because it's not spontaneous, that connection. Because everything in our uh, lives um, is an attempt to divide different sort of violences and specific responses to different forms of the violence, but to avoid this idea of systemic reading of violence, and at the same time, very embedded and situated forms of violence. So I think that uh, the neoliberal context uh, is fundamental, and also because I, I think that when we are talking about uh, uh, the new phase of neoliberalism in terms of authoritarianism, for example, um, well, I think that the, the feminist movement is doing the most accurate analysis of this entanglement of violences that allows us to talk about neoliberalism in uh, authoritarian terms. Um, and also, I think that it's important how we situate in the social reproduction field uh, the, the battleground of these different webs of, uh, web of uh, violences. So, um, of course, domination is not uh, um, avoided uh, as a term. But I think that we are thinking new forms of domination when the violence is increasing in neoliberal terms. So um, this is the, the way I try to, to connect, for example, the, uh, the research about financialization of everyday life as a form of content of the crisis, and at the same time, uh, the, uh, the political capacity to uh, uh, to answer to that. But of course, uh, there is a double dynamic uh, all, all the time. About the, the question of affective uh, dimension of cry and, and, and fear, I think this is the, the other very important moment of this production of knowledge and political um, uh, spaces, how we uh, um, produce an affective um, moment of sharing different uh, fears and different, uh, well, insecurities also. The, the assembly first is a very, um, and other political spaces, um, a very cathartic moment in, in that sense that we have first to realize what we are feeling and how these feelings are very concrete information of the political situation. And, and, and I think that is um, uh, also a very important component of that slogans, how you connect with that kind of feelings. So uh, that maybe could be uh, say something more, but 
in order to be very, very short. And about the, the, the last uh, question, that is, uh, we are in a very critical uh, moment. We have an inflation of 120%. That means a very crazy everyday uh, situation and uh, maybe the far right coming uh, the next year. Uh, in, but the election is one month ahead. Um, we are now doing things. We are now building alliances and assemblies and doing campaigns. Um, we have the experience of, um, of the previous neoliberal government, the Mauricio Macri, uh, and it was the moment of the explosion of the feminist movement. And this is a very important uh, moment of resistance against uh, Macri. Uh, and it was very important uh, the, the way that the feminist movement uh, uh, organized the resistance against uh, that um, government. But I think this is a new moment and, and it is uh, more difficult to think how we will survive and how we have to be, um, yes, in, in a collective state of alert uh, with very new conditions. So we are doing a lot of things, trying to avoid uh, the election of this uh, ultra right wing candidate the next month. We are doing assemblies, we are doing campaign, we have a plurinational meeting a week before the elections. That is a traditional, very important uh, meeting uh, for different feminism uh, in Argentina. Um, and we are thinking first to stop this candidate. Well, I'm afraid we also have to stop now for the moment. But I mean, it's obvious that these are politically and theoretically extremely urgent questions and I'm super grateful to both of you for um, this wonderful conversation. We really hope that you can stop him. <laughs> it also shows the importance of transnational alliances and solidarity that, that has been a, a, an important aspect of your work. And yeah, this is just uh, one more step and I hope you can continue the conversation very soon. Thanks to everyone uh, and enjoy the break. Thank you.